Okay, so Isaiah, um, longest uh, single author book in the Bible, just not counting Psalms, and arguably most confusing book in the Bible. If you've ever read through it, you know what I'm talking about. I remember reading through it as a teenager and being like, what in the world? <laughs> um, but also, not counting Psalms, most quoted book in the New Testament. And so, obviously, God thought it was important to include a lot of Isaiah's material. So, um, hopefully, we'll just break it down and make it simple for this class. So, let's start with the first verse. Um, it's printed out there on the page below the timeline. Oh, we have one more. Oh, hey! Okay. You are not late. You are one minute early. Oh, okay, good. Behind me, they're late. <laughs> Isaiah 48, verse 1. So she can just. So I've got a binder. Okay, you, here. Just give her this. Oh, we got another one. Here. There's one more. All right. If you want one, you can use this. Thank you. You might have to move the coffee to that table, Katie. Yeah, you know what? I'm going to help you out here. Okay. Move this. But feel free, people, to help yourself do coffee and donuts. Snail. What? I can't hear it. I can copy your notes. Oh. <laughs> hey. Hi there. Hi there. Hi there. Pass me that basket, I'll get that off the table. Do you want cream or sugar? So, you know, before we start, actually, we should probably all go around and introduce ourselves. I doubt everybody knows everybody. <clears throat> so, I'll start. My name is Jacob. Um, and I'm Kate. Let, yeah, let's introduce ourselves and say one thing about ourselves. My, my name is Jacob, and um, my first car was a Chevette scooter. <laughs> a 1983 Chevette scooter. Okay, my name is Kate France, and uh, I have four children. I have a two-year-old, a four-year-old, a seven-year-old, and a year old my name is Donna Gardner, and I'm short, so I only taught second grade. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. My name is Steve, Katie's uncle, and George and Michelle's mother in law. And I like donuts. <laughs> <laughs> my name is Dean, I'm Bobby, the newest member of the church, and my missionary work is to weed the patio, which is kind of a never ending job. I'm Barbara Robinson, and I like horses. Okay. I'm Joe Hamlin, and my wife is Kathleen. And if you know, we have two children. We've been in Cleveland, we've been down about 14 years, and we're going to sell real estate. Working on audiovisual and getting everything on YouTube and mm -hmm. go electronic. I hate playing Harwood, and I can't get the hair in the Really? Why Joe gave you that one? I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, mine doesn't go back. Mine doesn't go back either. Mine doesn't either. No, you mentioned it. Try the lever on that side. Put your coffee down. <laughs> That's open down. Yeah. Oh. Sorry about that. So, sorry, I'll fix that. Oh, it's in the front. It's in the front. No, I'm in the front. Okay. Um, I'm Lynn Bennett. 
Um, I'm here with my husband. We've been living here for seven years now, almost to the day. And we have two sons who are also live in Florida. Cool. Ellen Bosler, uh, my husband and I have lived here for 11 years. And we have two daughters and four grandchildren up in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. So I go back and forth a lot. <laughs> My name is Lynn Major, and um, I just got home last night about 12.30 in the morning from spending about three wonderful weeks with my six grandchildren and two sons and their families in Maryland and New Jersey. So I'm a little tired today. Yeah. <laughs> Have you guys ever gone up together? Pardon me? Have you guys ever gone up together when the car pulled up? No, we haven't. <laughs> uh, well, we car pulled down because... I flew up it. to drive down with her. Oh, oh, yeah. 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 I moved here seven years ago. Yeah. 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 Wow. Okay. So, Isaiah, uh, let's look at the first verse. It's printed there. Um, below the timeline. Katie, you want to read the first ver verses 1 and 2 that, that are there? Isaiah chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. The vision concerning Judah and Jerusalem that Isaiah, son of Amoz, saw during the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Hear me, you heavens. Listen, earth, for the Lord has spoken. Okay, so who can tell me, based on what we just looked at, the opening lines, who or what this vision of Isaiah is about? What's that? Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, good. Judah. Of Judah, which is a very small kingdom, and Jerusalem, which is the capital city of that kingdom. Yes. Okay, so in order to understand who this book is to, and therefore a lot of things about it, we're going to have to look at the history. That's why there's a timeline there. Um, so, just very general. It's sort of the history of the world, as you can see. Uh, it starts with creation, ends with the new creation of the new heaven and the new earth. So, Katie's going to take yeah. us through that chart just to get the general Right. So, at idea. the beginning, you see heaven and earth. And that is just creation, that's the verb where all time starts. You can label these if you want, and there will be some blanks to fill in. Um, One other thing. Also, don't feel like you have to get all this right now. This, we're just going to lay out the general thing, and we'll come back, to, we'll refer back to this and talk about it more, but this is just to give you an overview. Right, right. How many of you guys have seen Jacob's timeline before in a different class? As you can see, right? Yeah. So you might already be a little bit familiar. Just some, about half. I remember when he first made it and started using it to preach, and it's gotten a lot more detail. <laughs> this is going to be the Bible written out. <laughs> but anyway, so we have creation at the beginning and the new heaven and the new earth at the very end, so all the way over on the right. Um, and then what's kind of there in the middle? It's like a black cross. What do you think that represents? The opposite. Jesus. Jesus. Right. So then you can see where we are now in 2019, roughly 2,000 years after that. So what's this weird, all the way on the left, right after creation, this spire? Tower of Babel, that's right. It's kind of an important thing. And then we have some names, okay? These are kind of key figures in the Old Testament. The first one is Abraham, kind of father of the Jews, actually the father of all the three years. So they all kind of look in him like kind of father. And then there's a block there, and afterwards comes Moses. Right? So he was a key figure who brought them out of, out of what? Slavery, yes. So in that little box you can write Egypt and slavery. Okay? So then you have Moses who brought them out of that. And then at the year 1000, we see the start of the king. So what happened between that? Before Israel got the monarchy, 
what kind of rulership did they have after they were brought into the land? Yes, the judges. You can write judges in that box. Okay. And then you get to the kings. And so in that wishbone shape, does it say kings on yours? Okay. It says kings. And then it kind of splits off. Does anybody remember what happened there? So we call that Israel on the top and Judah on the bottom. And then there was, we see that the bottom, the Judah kingdom, suddenly stops. And can anybody tell me why? What happened there? Yes, so we call that the exile. You can write that in the little red box is when they were exiled. And then a little period after there we call the post-exile, which doesn't give you a whole lot more information. But it is called the post-exile period. And then you have sort of like a blank. Um, don't worry about it too much. It's called the silent era. That's sort of a misnomer. There's really a lot happening. There's a lot of historical documentation of what's going on. It's not in our Bible. I think it is in the Catholic Bible. A lot of Maccabee stuff. And, um, but things are really happening with Hanukkah. So, uh, and then you finally get to Jesus. And then a lot has happened after that to now, but we don't know how much farther the line goes before Jesus returns. So that's just a brief overview of where we are so far. But does anybody, everybody have the blanks filled out? Okay. And we'll, we'll come back to that if you, that's sort of, you know, the history of the whole world in five minutes. So <laughs> don't, don't worry about getting all of it. Okay. <laughs> uh, question two says, who is commanded to listen to what the Lord spoke to and through Isaiah? Yeah, heavens and earth. Uh, is that audience literal? Is God really telling the heavens and the earth to listen? What do you think? Why not? Yeah. I, actually, I think in one way it is um, not literal. It's a, a metaphor. But in another way it is. Because at the end of this book, um, if we were to turn over to the last chapter, verse 22... By the way, I, got, I brought a bunch of paper Bibles if anybody wants one. I've got several here. Sometimes it's easier to flip around in a paper Bible than on a device. But um, if you look at the very last chapter, Isaiah 66, verse 22, it says, the start of the very last paragraph in the book, as the new heavens and the new earth that I will make will endure before me, declares the Lord, so will your name and descendants endure. <clears throat> so all of creation is going to be remade uh, according to Isaiah's prophecy. So they're going to be affected too, the heavens and the earth not just Judah and Jerusalem and not just human beings. Um, <clears throat> okay, so um, God, what he's doing here when he says, hear me, you heavens and earth, we don't recognize that, but um, that, for the culture of the time, was courtroom language. Like... Um, if you were just talking to your child alone in your house and you said, you're saying all the things he did wrong, and then at the end you said, house, walls, ceiling, what verdict do you find? Or is my child guilty as charged? You use courtroom language like that. You don't necessarily need to be in a courtroom. Um, the point is when you do that, there's going to be an accusation or an indictment 
And so that's going to be what follows. So um, it's like he's calling the heavens and the earth the jury or calling them as a witness for the prosecution because he's about to launch into a big indictment of this little nation of Judah. Yeah, that's what the answer to number four. Uh, yeah, why use courtroom language? He's about to level an indictment. He's going to make an accusation. I think a more like modern thing would be if I were to say, you know, let the record show. I told you we should have driven separately. Like in case if there's going to be a judgment at the end of who's right and who's wrong, there's no record. Nobody's going to come back and look at the transcript. But I might say that. You know. Yeah, a way to metaphorically use courtroom language. Yeah. So, um, let's go to the next page. And <clears throat> the first five chapters are what we're going to cover today. They function as an introduction because they give us the situation of what's going on in Isaiah's day. So, <clears throat> um, and this, this little introduction section, these five chapters, are just filled with indictments of Judah and Jerusalem. So let's look at what the situation was like when Isaiah started his ministry. Um, let's see. Because if you go to Judah and Jerusalem now, <clears throat> they have a totally different situation. But he was talking to Judah and Jerusalem at a specific time. So we're just trying to find out what it was like there and what was going on. Yeah, so let's see. We've got one, two, three, four, five. Um, why don't we have, um, uh, if we break up into groups of two, that would give us about, there's one person might have to work on their own, but that would give us about five groups. Um, you and Donna can be together? Okay. Um, <clears throat> yeah, that'll work. So, um, uh, Lynn and Ellie, can you look at uh, the first, the religious situation, and it lists those verses there. So just look at those verses and write down what was going on religiously. What was the, the situation like religiously? And then the rest of them are moral, civic, and social situations. Um, so um, Lynn and Michael, could you look at those verses there? And you can divide them up or whatever, however you want to do that. Um, and just write down what those verses say about what the situation was like. Um, let's see. Joe, are you going to, do you want to do this? Uh, yeah, I can. I'll have to Oh, oh. Okay. Um, all right, then um, Barbara and Dean, can you do... Um, five, one through seven. Five, one through seven. Oh. Okay. Yeah. And then I guess um, maybe all three of you, Steve, Donna. Well, Steve and Donna can just do um, the next section. Um, Is that three through three, three through seven? Yeah, but don't do five, seven because the other group's going to cover that. I wasn't sure how many people were going to come. And then also 5.8. So, so some verses from chapter 3 and one verse from chapter 5. Okay. Um, and then, Kate, you can do that last bit. Okay, so just go ahead and take a look at those verses and write what the situation was like. If you have questions, it's totally fine.
Yeah, feel free to chat with each other and ask. Oh yeah, yeah, exactly. Just want to go on record saying once again, the left-handed people are persecuted. <laughs> It's just, I think I included this just to show that. Do something, let him do it. Let it come. Let it happen. Yeah. It's like saying God's not going to bring judgment. feeling pretty good about what you've got? Okay. Well, let's, let's get together and talk about it. <clears throat> so, um, what did you guys get for the religious situation? What's going on there? Okay. And if there's ever a a time when it says who it is specifically, because sometimes it can refer to a specific group or something. Uh, put include that. So you had hard-hearted. What else? Well, what did you find about the religious situation? Oh, okay. Um, they were living immorally and ethically uh, and broken in the covenant of God. Immoral and broken covenant. Idolatry. Idols. So they had a, when you say broken their covenant, can you tell everyone what, what you mean by that? Mm. Yeah, so, <clears throat> so the Jewish people had a covenant with God that, that they got way back at Mount Sinai. Now that was almost a thousand years previous. Um, and now Isaiah comes along and is saying we're not keeping that covenant we made with God. Jacob, was the covenant, the covenant the same as Moses' law, similar to Moses' law? Yeah. Yes, it was, exactly. Their job in the Mosaic Covenant was to <laughs> obey the laws, and God had promises for them. He said, if you disobey, this is what's going to happen. If you obey, this is what's going to happen. That was the covenant. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that was, uh, that was a long time ago at this point in Isaiah's day, and they are totally, totally forsaking it. Anything else? Did it describe, um, let's just take a look at uh, 
2, 6 through 8. Um, they have superstitions from the East. Um, verse 8, the land is full of idols. Let's see. Oh, what about, what about 1, sorry, 1, 11 through 15? Okay, yeah. <clears throat> the multitude of your sacrifices, what are they to me, says the Lord? I have more than enough burnt offerings or of rams and fattened animals. So these sacrifices that Moses commanded them to make, that God commanded them through Moses, they're still doing those. Um, let's see. Um, verse 13. Stop bringing me meaningless offerings. Your incense, that was another thing they were supposed to do, it's detestable to me. New moons, Sabbaths, convocations, they're still holding the religious festivals to Yahweh that Moses commanded. They're still doing the rituals that Moses commanded them to do, and God says, I hate it. It was just outward. Appearance. It was just outward. Yeah, because that whole section ends with um, the end of verse 15. Your hands are full of blood. You, you're going to the temple. Well, yeah, you're going to the temple. You're doing the sacrifices. You're burning the incense. You're doing the new moon things and the feasts and the, all that. You're doing all the trappings. Meanwhile, you're guilty of murder. And you're letting people starve to death because you don't want to sell grain at a certain price. So, um, so yeah, religiously they're very immoral, but they're still doing the the rituals, which is not um, is not at all what the point of those rituals was. Um, <clears throat> Oh, rituals. yeah, empty rituals would be good. Yeah. Um, yeah, empty rituals. Okay, so um, now specifically in these next, this next section, be sure to look at who is doing these things because often in this section it says, woe to this group, woe to that group, or whatever. So what did you guys find? Uh, Lynn and Michael? Okay. They rebelled. Good. Okay, so, sorry. God's, is a son singular or plural? God's sons and the nation. They were, what did you say? Okay. Zion, um, a prostitute, mm -hmm. harlot. Okay. Uh, the uh, silver became dross, worthless rubbish, metal out of the money was worthless. They, uh, their wine became mixed with water, watered down, weakened. Uh, the princes, the government became corrupt. They were crooks. They were bought. They were bribed. They, were, they went out. They didn't help the orphans, the widows. Okay, hang on. So the government officials are taking bribes and are corrupt. Um, mm -hmm. 
corrupt and unjust. So this are this would be like judges. Um, oh, you're a poor person. You can't give me a bribe. Well then, I'm yeah. Rule your yeah, I'll just rule in the favor of whoever gives. Yeah. Just like that. <laughs> um, Um, <clears throat> yeah, um, well, there's some metaphors there. Um, prostitution and adultery is often a metaphor for God saying, you're cheating on me with other gods. Um, you're worshiping other gods in your heart um, and in private when publicly you're still coming to the temple and not worshiping me. So it's, it's a comparison. And then you also mentioned the silver is becoming mixed with dross or impurities and the wine is becoming mixed. So you, you see that um, diluting of the silver and diluting of the wine because the people are taking Judaism and they're mixing pagan religions in with it. Um, anything else? Okay, so so Judah and Jerusalem are compared to Sodom and Gomorrah, which is you're right, which is um, referencing the openness of it. That that was the kind of did five one seven. Anyone else do five one seven? Yeah. Okay, we're going to talk about it. Okay. Um, Barbara and Dean, what did you guys find? Well, uh, I'll start basically with talking about a vineyard of great potential on fertile soil that yielded only bad fruit. You compare that to men of Jerusalem and Judah in the same way, where they failed. Okay, so this is a very terrible drawing of a vineyard with a wall around it. This is the wall. I don't know, I guess probably a stone wall. You know. um, <clears throat> and obviously, <clears throat> if you have a vineyard, you put a wall around it because <clears throat> you don't want people to take your, your produce and also you don't want wild animals to be able to come and get it. <clears throat> so you're protecting your produce. So I, I did everything good, right? For my vineyard, I got it all. The soil was good. I had a nice wall around it. <clears throat> what else does he say? Do you remember? He says some other thing. Had a wine press. <clears throat> oh yeah. So you dig out a wine press. So you have a um, a vat where your workers can um, step on the bare feet, step on the grapes, and it's all carved right out of the stone so that all the liquid will flow through a little hole into your, and all your pulp and the vines and the skins will be left up there. Um, you cleared of all the stones? The stones. <clears throat> yeah, the soil's really prepared, everything, I dug this all out, I did it all great, and then what happened? They turned up wild grapes instead of the grapes that you planted. Yeah, so I didn't get the produce that I planted. <clears throat> and that's all a big metaphor for what? Same things that happened earlier. Right, and you're not, yeah, so I, <clears throat> what do you think taking care of the soil and the wall and the digging out the wine, doing everything right, <clears throat> what do you think that represents in, in, referred, in reference to the Jews? Yes. 
Yes, but some of those things God's saying, I did for you. So God kept up his end of it. Yeah, the promised he gave them land. Victory and, over their enemies around them. He made it all nice. He gave them milk and honey. Everything. I did everything for you. All good. You were a bunch you of. Are giving me back wild grapes. You were a bunch of slaves. I took care of you. I gave you a great kingdom and all of that. It is. It is like the Garden of Eden. I gave Adam and Eve. I gave you everything you could possibly want, and you still, well, rejected me. That's messing it up. <clears throat> It is, but a lot of times people refer to a mess up as an accident. Oh, no. It's not an accident, it's a choice. That's, that was my point. Um, yeah, they messed it up because they decided they wanted to do what they wanted to do. They wanted to rebel. Thanks, God, but I'm going to go my own way. Um, <clears throat> okay, and then what did you guys find? Uh, the Lord was addressing his people's elders and princes and the daughters of Zion. Basically, they were abuse of power. They were taking everything for themselves and abusing the people on the earth. Elders, leaders, and they're abusing um, the power given to them. Yeah, they're abusing their power. And they're abusing, what would you say, the people under them? The, Correct. Just the people? Maybe the masses? Good. Well, he was saying that, um, that the Lord would please and stand to judge the people. I mean, they were told they were going to be judged. And I had, they were questioning how the people were being treated because they were taking leaving the spoil for the people that were there and they were taking from the things themselves and they were good. Okay. Can you give me the verse for that? Chapter 3, verse 14. Okay, the spoil of the poor is in your houses. So the powerful and the rich are abusing their power in order to abuse the poor. Grind the faces of the poor. So that's a very striking image. Just not, they're not, probably not literally grinding their faces, because yeah. what would they gain from that? But <clears throat> the point is crushing the faces of the poor, yeah. Um, and then he talked about the women and how they acted. They were very bloody. Um, if you could look, look, look at um, <clears throat> the women of Israel, they walked with stretched forward neck, wandering on. Okay, so the powerful people are doing this. The women are doing what? This is they're very haughty. Um, haughty. Okay, I don't know how to spell haughty. H a u g h t y. G h. There we go. Um. <coughs> okay. Yeah, and then what's going to happen to those women? That the Lord would smite them with the scab of crowns that had of the daughters of Zion. And we will discover their secret life. So, um, yeah. They're, they're getting all... Make them bald. Yeah, they're, they're taking, making themselves beautiful, thinking they're so great, and God's going to... And their hair is the glory, so you can know their glory. Yeah, God's going to shame them. <clears throat> we didn't go that far, but it's interesting to hear that. <laughs> and it's, yeah, and you said it. We just went to 17, and then we did 5 8. 
and the dab is saying woe to them in my days. It says, and what is warning them against is going house to house that they feel the field. Yeah, why would it be bad to add house to house and join field to field? Are they talking about going into the different people, intermarrying, that kind of thing? No, um, they are talking, Isaiah and through God is talking, or God through Isaiah, is talking about people who are buying up all the land, oh. making monopolies. Um, it's supposed to be everybody has their own property, um, if you remember, they, got, they all got an inheritance and they weren't supposed to sell it. They were supposed to pass it on to their kids. And they could sell it. Every seven years, it went back. Yeah, the land would come back every, every so many years. So, um, <clears throat> um, God didn't want just a few wealthy landowners and everyone else was serfs for those landowners. Um, that's what happened in Europe and in wasn't such a great situation for most people. Um, but they weren't following that law. They were just buying it up, adding house to house to house. Till it was, the whole land was owned by a few. And you live along and, the land. And then what can you do when you don't own your own land? You just have to work for whatever the landowner is willing to pay you. That's how they're grinding the faces of the poor. The poor have nothing to do. They took, the poor go to the officials and say, hey, this isn't right. He's paying me not nearly what is, this isn't right. And the judge is like, um, no, I think, it, I think it is right. Right? And so the poor can do nothing about it because everybody's corrupt. <clears throat> okay, good, excellent. And Kate, did you find anything? Yeah, there's a, a lot. Um, from chapter 5, 11, and 12. Okay, hang on. Let people have a chance to. 5, 11, and 12? Yes. Okay. The focus is there on, like, wine and alcohol. That's, like, their goal. Just trying to get <laughs> to be drunk. And then also the focus is on, like, parties and entertainment. And then the last phrase of that, they have no regard for the deeds of the Lord, no respect for the work of Okay. It's just like the absence of that. They're focusing on themselves and their pleasures. So it wasn't the production of it, it the actual drinking and everything. Well, I mean, I think it was more just like that that's what they cared about. That's all they cared about. It's like they get up in the morning, they run after the drinks, they stay up late at night, and they're playing with wine. Yeah, I it's mean, the actual consuming. She's asking, are they trying to produce oh, it? Oh, right. Yes, this is the consuming. Yeah. Yeah, they're they're interested in wine and pleasure. And who are these people? I don't know that it's said from what you told me. Okay. Well, um, so we had woe to those who add add house to house. Now we have woe to those who rise early in the morning to run after their drinks. That's verse eleven. Um, uh, let's see. Um, well, this is interesting. Um, verse 13 says, Therefore my people will go into exile. Man, they haven't gone into exile yet, J Judah. Um, but they will, long after Isaiah is dead. Well, not that long, but anyway. Um, okay, so their men of rank, this is verse 13, their men of rank will die of hunger. Their masses will be parched with thirst. So God's not just condemning the wealthy and the important here. It's also the people in general. Um, therefore the grave enlarges its ap appetites, um, opens its mouth without limit. This is verse 14. Into it will descend their nobles and masses with their brawlers and revelers. So man will be brought low, mankind humbled, the eyes of the arrogant humbled. Um, yeah, there's a lot, um, a lot more. But um, oh, here's one, down in verse 22. Woe to those who are heroes at drinking wine. Now, you know, well, if you don't know from experience, you know from like movies and stuff that there are these big drinking games, and there's a a, a pride about who can hold their liquor. Just real quick, who can hold their liquor better, and there's all kinds of... 
things like that. Um, and it says, champions, uh, heroes at drinking wine, champions at mixing drinks, the very next verse, 23, who acquit the guilty for a bribe, and deny justice to the innocent. So these people who are champions at drinking wine are judges. These are government officials. And right? I don't think it's a coincidence that you think of the word hero and a champion. Like if you champion a cause, you like speak for it and promote it. But they're heroing and championing like the worst possible things and then they're leaving the guilty. They, they're acquitting the guilty and denying justice to the innocent. So it's like the opposite. Yeah, they could be a hero and a champion of the for poor. For the good things, but they're not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but they're just for themselves and for their pleasures. Okay, so, all that. You didn't write that, sorry. That's okay. I think everyone's getting the general idea of how things were going in Isaiah's day. When we talk about the situation at the time, mostly positive things and mostly negative things. What was it like? Negative. negative. It was, yeah, it was, it was not negative. good. It might have been... Yeah. Yeah, there, there wasn't anything positive... Um, there were positive sections in there, but none of it was, all of it was Isaiah saying what's going to happen later. None of it was right now. Um, basically, he's saying, well, there's me and my kids. <laughs> and everybody else is uh, just forsaking the Lord. Except for outward things. But that actually, in God's mind, is, makes it worse. That, you, that they know at least the outward things. But, okay, so. Um, so we talked about what was going on, number three. Yeah, so very, very wicked is the big picture there. Um, yeah, at the bottom of the page it says, when did Isaiah see this vision? So let's turn the page and talk about when all this was happening. Now, um, This is a zoom in of part of the big chart. It's like a map and there's like an inset that's blown up on the edge. That's what this is. So if you want to turn back to the first page and look at it. See that wishbone shape in the middle that says the kings? Mm -hmm. We've taken that and this is the edge of that wishbone. Okay? So you still have the red box that says exile and the blue box that says post exile. So we're just giving a little more detail about it's just a little confusing. Okay, so there's the, the picture of the Old Testament. What we're looking at right now is just the very end of Israel in the north um, up through, how far does that go? It goes into the post-exile. So we're looking at just this portion zoomed way in. Now you can see um, what we didn't include on the big chart was why the northern kingdom of Israel ended. Um, that was because of Assyria. And that was during Isaiah's time. So Isaiah lived, he was in the south, in Judah, but their, what used to be part of their nation, would be like if the south had won the Civil War, and so there was two different countries, America, the north, and the south. Um, Isaiah was living in the south, and he saw the northern kingdom fall to Assyria. So when the kingships are ended, they both end for the same reason. The northern kingdom was just thrust into exile sooner, which is why their lives are shorter. Yeah. Just so, so you see those four kings. If you remember from verse 1, it says, this is the vision Isaiah saw um, concerning Judah and Jerusalem during the reign of these four kings. So Isaiah's ministry starts at the end of Uzziah, and goes through those other kings. So he lived a long time. He had a long ministry. <laughs> and, yeah. And um, Assyria came, and Assyria was a big, huge world power. And they came and they took over Israel. And they tried to also take over Judah. That's why I drew that little spike coming down into Judah. Um, 
in 701? It's not a speech bubble. Yeah, Kay, Kay thinks it looks like a speech bubble. Why are you making somebody talk? It doesn't make <laughs> uh, it's, it's, a, it's an attack. And actually, they, they basically took over every single city except Jerusalem. And they, they laid siege to it. They laid siege to it, but they couldn't. Um, we'll, we'll talk about that more later. But um, and that becomes an important part of this book. Uh, that was during Hezekiah's reign. Okay, so then, um, okay, when did Isaiah see this vision? That's actually the same question as question three from before. Mm -hmm. So you can write it on this page if you want with the, the image. Yeah, it was, it was during the reign of those four kings. So you can, you can write that out or you can just, or you could just write the years 740 to 686. If you, if that's easy, 746. It doesn't, it's not, a, it's not super important that you know the dates, but the point is, it was more than 50 years. His ministry was over the course of 54 years. So Isaiah had a long ministry. And think about, I mean, how much things changed in 50 years. Ups and downs. Um, like, from 1965, to today is 54 years. That's how long. Think how much America has changed since 1965. Um, or, or maybe a better example would be from 1925 to 1979. Think about the ups and downs. The Great Depression, the wars, and there's all kinds of different situations. So there was a lot of different stuff that happened during his ministry. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So um, you've seen probably a few changes since. I was lying when she did that. That makes me 37. Um. Okay. So if his if his it says the vision it starts out the vision that Isaiah saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. Does that mean that this vision, was he in some kind of visionary trance for 54 years? No. Um, over the years of his ministry, throughout the course of that, God gave him visions and revelations and words to preach. And the book that we have was compiled from certain parts of these. Obviously, if, you, if the book was everything he had done and preached in 54 years, it would be a lot longer than 66 chapters. So the book was <coughs> compiled from different parts of sermons and stories and things that happened. Okay, so question six. Since that's true, does that mean that this book is just a conglomeration of random sermons from his years of ministry? There's a lot of people who see Isaiah this way. They're like, they just kind of cobbled together a bunch of Isaiah's stuff and put it together into a book, and it's sort of just a hodgepodge. Um, but, um, but you remember... Uh, verse 1 said the vision that Isaiah saw, even though there's probably multiple visions and multiple uh, things. He calls it a singular vision because this book is a unified work. So um, essentially, it's a, it's a unified work of literature. So essentially, even though it is a compilation, it was very carefully under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit um, Isaiah took different um, speeches he had gave poems he had written a lot of his poetry and put it together I mean, most of the book is poetry and put it together into a work of literature and carefully. that's why these first five chapters uh, function as an introduction. Most of the other parts of the book 
you know which king he's talking to and what's going on historically. What we just went over those five chapters, it talked about the people in general and the state of the nation, but there were no specific names mentioned of certain kings because he wants to start out with a general survey of here's what it's like. Um, so that, that is an example of how Isaiah arranged all this stuff very carefully. Any questions about that? Okay. We've got five minutes for the last page. Um, so hopefully you got the gist that chapters one through five is just setting the stage for how bad it, it is morally. Um, here's the whole book. It, the book is divided into three basic sections, an outline of the book. And each section is about what's happening uh, with Judah, the little kingdom of Judah and its capital city, Jerusalem. So the first 39 chapters, uh, what's going on is they have a Davidic king. What do you think that means? Right. Yeah, a, a great-great-grandson of David is actually on the throne. Um, and the world power, in the world power box next to that section, is Assyria. And that's, it's terrifying. I mean, there was no Geneva Convention rules back then. Um, they, they were very fond of impaling people on really tall spikes so that everybody could see, oh, I don't wanna, I want to, I want them to like me. So whatever they want, whatever taxes they want, I don't want that to happen to me and my family. So Assyria was the world power, and and they came very close to um, falling to Assyria. Um, um, yeah. So here is here is Israel with the Sea of Galilee and the Jordan River. Uh, there's the north and the south, and there's Jerusalem. That's Mount Carmel there. This is the Nile. So that's Egypt. The Dead Sea. The Dead Sea. Oh, okay. There's the Mount Sinai, Jerusalem, the Dead Sea, the Sea of Galilee, the Jordan River. You see this in the back of your Bibles a lot, right? Yeah, the capital city, Samaria. Um, the Tigris and the Euphrates. And the Persian Gulf are over here. There's a big Arabian desert in the middle. Nineveh is the capital of Assyria, and essentially, in a world of city-states, Nineveh started capturing and built a huge empire, which encompassed almost everything. It encompassed all of this, but it didn't get Jerusalem. This huge world empire. Uh, at one point, Assyria actually had um, Egypt, but not right now, not during Isaiah's time. Okay, so it's up here. Now, the Babylon's over here, but Assyria has taken over Babylon. At this point. Yeah, um, but what's going to happen is Babylon is going to rebel and take over Assyria. So during the exile time, Babylon is the world power. Um, it almost seems like the same thing. It's just some Mesopotamian power, but it was a different, a different um, person in control, a different city-state that was ruling the whole thing. So Assyria crumbles, Babylon takes over, and that Babylon then eventually takes Judah into captivity, into exile. Now that doesn't happen during Isaiah's time, so that's a prophecy about the future. And then, so he dies before Judah goes into actual yes. exile. Yes, he does. That so, might be worth noting. Yes, but he says that it's going to happen. And then the last uh, eleven chapters of the book are about the return from exile, and that is Persia. Then Babylon falls, and Persia takes over, and Persia is a lot more lenient and they let the people go back. 
they see that Assyria and Babylon fall very quickly, and so they say, well, maybe if we're nicer to people, we can rule them longer, and it, and it worked. Now, Babylon was, is today, Iraq, and purchased Iran, is that right? Yeah. Roughly. I mean, the, yeah. It's not like the same boundaries, but yeah, that, that area. Okay. Persia, yeah, Persia was huge. <clears throat> yes. Yes, but where they started would be a little farther um, east than, than Babylon, yeah. Um, okay, so if Isaiah died in the 600s, why is this book about later time periods? Well, A, like I said, he was a prophet, so he was seeing the future. And B, uh, when you publish a book, the publishing date is just the start of its usefulness. Right? So generations were going to be reading his book, generations who lived through the exile. Um, we're going to learn what God, why that it happened, what God wanted from them. And then when they came back and they were like, okay, we're back in the land now, but it's, not quite the same. We don't have a king because Persia still owns us. Um, so his book was going to be useful for generations to come. Okay, question eight. What was going on with the world powers? Okay, we already did that. If you want to add in... Oh, well, we're out of time, so we won't do that. Okay. Um, oh, yeah. You didn't really I didn't do the summaries. summaries yet. No, we'll have to do that next week because we're, we're out of time. Um, number nine, another way to view this book, um, and I left blanks there on the scroll so you can write in, um, would be uh, the lead up on that first line and then the exile and then what's following. So what led up to the exile, then the exile, and then what happened after the exile. So the whole book centers around the exile. It was a huge event. It's impossible to overstate the significance of the exile in Jewish history. And it shaped everything about them as a people. They had problems with idolatry the whole Old Testament. You get to the New Testament times, any Jews wanting idols? No. The exile completely cured them of their desire for idols. They were completely 100% monotheists after the exile. And, and so that's part of why they had such a problem with Jesus. If they'd have been how they were back now, and Jesus kids, I'm God, like, okay, Jesus, you're God, I got Dagon, and I got Baal, and Astro, I got all these gods, whatever. But by New Testament times, um, so my point is the exile changed them so much psychologically as a people. And I'm sure you can understand that. Any group of people that gets taken, captured, taken away to a foreign land for more than a generation and then goes back, um, it would be very traumatic and changing. Like if we all got captured and taken to China. Yeah. So, um, and then the return. Uh, okay, so another way to see it, the, the three sections of this book, would be sin, punishment, and hope. So chapters 1 through 39 talk about all their sins. Like we just, you know, we just kind of went through a lot of their sins in the first five chapters, but it's got 39 <laughs> chapters of that. Uh, the sins, and then the exile is the punishment, and then the return is the hope. Because it's not just about the return. It's about the future hoping in general. So summary of the whole lesson today, the first five chapters are an introduction to the whole book, and the introduction lays out the book's three main themes. Judah's wickedness, and also human wickedness in general. It's not just 
about Judah. It's about humanity. Future judgment and then future hope. So that is, those are the themes of the book. That's how the book's divided into three parts. And each part has those, um, each part has a main focus. Any questions? Comments? All right, let's close in prayer. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for the sobering images we get of uh, what our hearts are like. We humans are wicked and um, we know that we will face judgment. And we thank you that you provided Jesus to bear our judgment for us and our punishment for us. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. So the prayer is the...